holding my position as the senior advisor of Crowdsourcing Week. Thank you. And as Seppi has mentioned, it's quite an interesting journey, you know, from what, nine months ago we connected. Uh, when he called me, I said, you know, what the hell he wants, right, this guy? <laughs> we spoke on Skype and he told me about his vision of uh, crowdsourcing and that immediately resonated with me because, you know, I started uh, this uh, closet, uh, which is a crowdsourced uh, fashion content site. And I said, wow, you know, I'm a firm believer of that. And, you know, Epi has done a great job and here we are today. Now, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I like to qualify on the title, right? I'm not that ambitious. It's, it's, it's a dream I have, right? So, but, you know, the empire was put up by Epi. And I thought, well, why not? Right? That's a great dream. Um, Closet is really, as uh, Epi has mentioned, you know, it's really an ecosystem, uh, woman-centric. Uh, if you go into the site, it has a very rich content contributed by beauty, fashion, uh, enthusiasts around the world. Uh, we encourage them to come, uh, discover, you know, what people has in the closet, what they share, what they bought and where you can buy them. Uh, this is also a platform from a business model where we allow brands, right? And not necessarily just fashion or beauty brands, but brands wanting to reach women, you know, to engage with them, cultivate relationships with them, mind their behavior, get insights into them, uh, grow fans and create advocates. I'll, I'll show you some example. Um, I'd like to keep this a little bit lighter today. I'm often asked this question, you know, why am I in this business? So look at my background. I've never been in the fashion business. I'm kind of old, uh, old guy. I started this company two and a half years, pretty old for a startup. Uh, I'm not trying to be cow like a few. So there's a story behind that. So let me tell you the story. Uh, I've, I've started a number of companies. So with Closet, there were a few things that Honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do, right? But there were a few things that I knew I didn't want to do. Now, we, we knew that in the market, brands were looking for more than just impressions, click-throughs, right? They were looking at a platform to engage with users. So I'm looking at how do I build an engagement platform? Now, the other thing I knew I didn't want to do was at CNET, and I was with ZDNet and CNET, I had a whole bunch of uh, editors, very difficult to manage, great people, but it's not very scalable. So if you look at, let's say, in the technology, you need a guy to write about enterprise content, you need a guy to write about digital ph photography, you need a guy to write, there's thousands of things that you need experts. So how do you compete with the crowd out there? So immediately I wanted something to focus on user-generated content, right? So those are the two key areas uh, that I wanted to do, right? Now, the next one was given that I was based in Singapore. We live in a very fragmented region, right? Fragmented by language, cultures, geographical barriers. How do you overcome some of this, right? So we decided on focus on visual user-generated content. So, so those are the premise of uh, what we started out to do. Now, where my inspiration came from was prior to starting Closet, I was traveling back in 2009, 275 days in that year alone. So when I came home, I tried to be a good husband, spend time with my wife. And what I realized was when I'm coming home, talking to her, her phone keeps ringing. So when I was home and I noticed my wife's phone keeps ringing, right? And uh, it's her friends, is it? Hubby's back. Why? You know, because what happened was while I was traveling, she has built up her whole network. And I felt that I was intruding into her life, right? So I said, well, the only way is embrace her life, right? So when I come home, I don't work, right? I go out with her, uh, with two small boys, sending them to school, wake up six o'clock in the morning, send them to school, and I go running with her friends, right? So we go to the stadium, sometimes it's three, four, five, you know, ladies. And after that, Singapore is very common, right? We go to the hawker center, we have breakfast, and I sit there and I listen to the conversation, right? I'm sitting there, and, and over time, I became one of the girls, right? <laughs> I, I was accepted. 
and, and it was a very interesting observation, right? Because my wife travels quite a bit with me. So when she comes back, typically the conversation revolves around four questions. Number one, do you know all or no dancers? What did you buy? Right? Second, how much? Third one, where? Right? The fourth one is, show me. Right? Now, never happened. Right? You're a busy. Oh, come to my house. I got, I got this new bag and blah, blah, blah. So I uh, said, in my mind, I kind of, wow. You know, why don't I create a platform right, for these women? So, so those were the early germinations of the idea. Um, now, the other interesting phenomenon, I know some of these women are going to wag their heads, uh, is women love to share and ask for recommendations. Right? In my wife's group, I observe, right, like my wife is a beauty junkie. So this is one of my way of getting back money from the brands. <laughs> no, she, she is, right, she's a beauty junkie. And uh, the last trip, you know, we were going to Taiwan and she bought like $600 worth of SK2, you know, whitening masks, right, for all friends. So they are very influenced by what she buys and what she recommends, right? Within the group, there's a lady who, the husband sells dried seafood, right? And she'll tell you when is the best season to buy abalone, <laughs> mushrooms, and someone is a gardening expert. So I think we see that women are very driven uh, by recommendations, they make decisions based on it. So this was the premise of uh, how uh, Closet started. So we decided to form this uh, visual, uh, user-generated content where users can share, recommend. Now, of course, I think along the way, we had some challenges as well, right? And, and this is where as a startup, we try to overcome some of these challenges. Uh, a, a good example was we got a lot of feedback where uh, we had a user who upload the look of the day, right? They look at all these pictures, wonderful, right? And sometimes they ask a question and say, where do I buy this outfit? And I got stuck with a problem, right? So sometimes maybe some of these users don't respond. Uh, sometimes they say, well, I bought this two years ago in London. What are you going to do, right? Or even if I bought it a week ago. Um, so I'm, I'm piloting. If you look at the last, one of the new startups that I started, it's called vSense. Uh, it's a collaboration project and I work with them and say, how do I solve this problem? So essentially, we are launching probably at the end of this month a technology where visually we can recognize what the user is wearing. Extract those information, match that to a shopping database that we have and recommend you where to buy. So this is where Closet, our business model is really leveraging on the crowd to share, right, with uh, products, images, uh, and to inspire others. And you can do a reverse search, right? You can upload, I bought this pair of shoes, and then you, you upload that and you find out how to match that pair of shoes with other things that people are wearing, similar to the shoes that you have bought. So there's a little bit of background. Now, of course, I, I would say the, the best upside for that is... Uh, Where's Bill, right? So Bill, uh, Bill is up there, he's my friend. Um, you know, together, Bill and I, we probably have about 80 years in the technology industry. <laughs> and, and, and Bill is always very envious, right? Roger is always hanging around the girls. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, my best motivation was after about two, two months of studying Closet, uh, I was fortunate, I got invited fun row to the Malaysian International Fashion Festival. Right now, at, at, uh, uh, at CNET, we used to attend Comdex and so on and so forth. Uh, and I was sitting in the front row, you know, watching all the runway show, and I say, hey, you know, this show beats uh, the hell out of watching, uh, looking at routers and switches and servers. <laughs> so that's one of my motivation. Now, having said that, then, the, I, I'd like to show you a little bit, right? Um, Now, we do a little bit of localization. So, Closet, while we said that uh, visual content transcends a lot of cultural geographical barriers, that's very true, right? So, for example, if you look at, uh, you know, for those in the know, right, women, if you look at the Chanel 2.55 pack, 
a picture of a Chanel 2.5 bag is a Chanel 2.5 bag in any language, in any culture, women recognize it. You know, whether it's a, uh, a Louboutin shoe or whatever, you know, you recognize it. But then, along the way, we pivoted a little bit because we realized that there were subtle differences. So we launched a, a site in Indonesia uh, with a local partner. So you can see, we customize something. Instead of your general look of the day, we have hijab of the day. Right? Very interesting, hijab of the day. Now, how do we monetize this? These are the pictures that are live coming. I think the event is on. There's an Indonesian Islamic fashion fair. So we are doing a campaign for them where we encourage the crowd. Right? We market this not just in Malaysia, but also in, uh, not just in Indonesia, but across Malaysia, where you have a strong Muslim population to share. Right? How do you wear your hijab? Now, I've sh I put this up in the closet, and people who are not familiar with uh, Muslim fashion always equate that to you know, the, 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 the burqa that you see in the Middle East. So this is a type of discovery that uh, you know, users are able to, uh, to enjoy at, at closet. So we, we charge clients for services like that. You know? So this, this is part of the ongoing campaign. Now, here, this is nail art on closet. Now, if you look at uh, going back to CNET days, right, we probably have thousands of women contributing nail art, you know, photos, videos. You know, how, how would I have been able you know, to hire enough editors, writers to talk about every subject? So, on closet, we are not just fashion and beauty, right? On beauty, you have makeup, uh, you have uh, skincare, you have hair. How do you do your hair? How do you do your bun? Nail art, uh, accessories, there are so many things. So how do you get so many experts? So this is a good example, right? Uh, and people are inspired. So I think this is just some of the rationale you know, for going into crowdsourcing. Now just uh, to share with you a little bit, um, this slide, I, I, I did it you know, for an event I was speaking at about some of the things that company uh, should be looking at you know, you're considering crowdsourcing you know, for your business strategy. A couple of things, you know, crowdsourcing is not a project. It's not a campaign, right? You, you need to embrace it. You need to weave it into the, uh, into the culture of your company. Now, I think it's very much easier said than done. Right? Truly, I, I, I've worked with companies and they just think that, wow, you know, crowdsourcing means that I run some campaign and it's done, right? So I think it takes a lot more effort and you really, really need to create a vision, a culture, and for those who want to push it in your organization, to make sure that you really have the support of your management. I think that's very key. External factors? Well, for Closet, when we look at, uh, we felt fashion was something that could really translate visually. So crowdsourcing, to be honest, you really have to look at what you're doing. There's a lot of regulations, right? Recently, you know, Singapore government has regulated that those who write news has to be licensed. So if you are doing outsourcing of news, then you, you, you are impacted by new regulations. So you have to look at the industry, the country that you're operating in, uh, and how that will impact you know, the crowdsourcing activities that you want to do. Setting goals, um, you know, what, what type of uh, results do you want from your crowdsourcing activities, why? You know, how does that complement with what you're doing? Those are key. And know your cloud, right? I think you have to understand your, you know, billions of people out there, but I don't think the billions are right for your particular, not all are right for your particular business. So you must, under, you must understand who you want to reach and how do you want to reach them. Just to share with you, right? So one of my passion is really you know, coming from the media business, I do a lot of digital media consumption behavior study. Now look at the new millennium generation. The way they consume media is very different. I was just chatting to an old friend of mine. She was saying that the only way we talk to our kids is not email. I'm the email generation. My kids are the chat generation. WhatsApp. So my phone has 
WhatsApp group, right? I have my, me and my wife, four, um, me and my wife, my two sons, and my extended family. What's that? They don't respond to email. A um, couple of weeks ago, I was having a dinner with a banker friend of mine. She's retired, you know, grandma. Have a granddaughter about two years old. And she was relating this story, and it's true, right? She was saying that, I asked her, name is Shirley. I said, what do you do? Oh, playing with my kids. Uh, I mean, green, playing with my granddaughter, you know. Uh, she really loves the iPad, you know. She has all these photos that <laughs> makes her flip through. And she was saying that one day, she was watching uh, TV with her, sitting on the TV. And probably she didn't like the program, right? She got up and she tottered to the TV and started flicking the screen. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean this, this, this is a true story. And then this is the type of user behavior that we have to be attuned to right, in dealing with the crowd. So what type of crowd? What is the age group? What's the profile? I think those are very key attributes you have to understand. Marketing. Now, most people think that you know, building a crowdsourcing business or a website is like the movie, you know, few of dreams. Build and they will come. Not true. <laughs> Absolutely not true, right? So make sure that you have a way to reach a crowd. Know your crowd. How do you reach them? Very key. Um, getting the crowd is very hard. And I absolutely advocate that you nurture them. I think there are many ways that you can, within the crowd, look for what we call the influencers. Right? We do a lot of that with brands. I think some of the speakers earlier have mentioned that. Uh, different platforms have different ways of doing that. But in our case, uh, it's very easy for us to notice who are the ones that are very active in particular brands, then how do you, through uh, this engagement, cultivate them and make them into really your advocates, your ambassadors? So we do a lot of these activities with brands. Uh, data mining, one of my favorites. So I think, for example, in all the activities that the women do on our side, we examine you know, the brands that they like, what do they do. Uh, I think this provides very valuable information for us to recommend. Uh, things that are of interest to them. Uh, last but not least, we are living in a very fast-paced world, right? So if you are embarking on something in a crowdsourcing area, you have to be very agile, right? You have to adapt to changes in the environment, regulations, user behavior. So these are the key things that you really have to watch out for. Now, I pulled out this slide. I don't know how many of you know Jake Mackey. I think he's consulting for PwC now, right? Now this slide was done back in, I think 2008. The numbers have changed a little bit, but by and large it's the same, right? You know, it is one of the number one challenge in crowd content, uh, crowd content creation. If you look at uh, some of these numbers, right? Amazon, Wikipedia, YouTube, uh, TripAdvisor, you have a very small percentage of what we call creators, right? These are people who really upload uh, a product review, uh, 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 whatever, right? So I think these are the people who actually create the content. And then you have about 9% of them. This is called the 99 rule. 9% 9 of them would maybe just add on and comment, right? And then the rest would be really what we say they are the observers, the audience, people who just consume audience, uh, consume the content. Uh, in the case of Closet, we are probably the upper triangle. We are probably in that 20, 25%, which is not bad, right? But still, a lot, of the, a lot of the content are created by what we call the super users. So this is where, you know, in the earlier slide, I talked about knowing who are the influencers, who are the advocates uh, who are very active in the site. I think these are great people who create very rich content. Now, some of the challenges that we had was you don't know the crowd. Right? Wait, when Closet first started, it's tough. <laughs> very tough, right? You know, who are you? Who's Closet? I have to hide my face, especially when they see this old guy, right? <laughs> uh, so I think this is where uh, in the beginning, right, we had to do a lot of uh, 
uh, pop, we have to populate, we have to find friends, we have to find uh, you know, people with good taste to populate the site, and then we do a lot of seeding, you know, uh, getting users to come, you know, creating the environment. So slowly, over time, right, we have earned the task. It, it takes time, right? I think the crowd doesn't just, just because you have a platform, they'll come. Right? So it takes time for you to earn their trust. I think there's a key word. I think this has been mentioned over and over again. Getting the trust of your users is very, very important. Others are competing. Right? I, I think you have seen that. Whether is it 99 designs or whatnot, you have competition out there. So how do you differentiate yourself? Right? That's the key again. Uh, copyright of the content. Right? I think we have a panel coming up next. So I'll leave that to my panelists to address the questions. Uh, I was uh, interviewed by BBC a couple of months ago right, about crowdsourcing. So I, I was asked like, hey, you know, how do you control the crowd? I said, by definition, the crowd cannot be controlled. Right? So I think that's, that's the truth. So on Closet, we only have one person to moderate. Only one, right? To moderate, not like even to control. And honestly, I'll tell you that in the last two and a half years, I think we had only to take down a photo once, right? And it was a little girl, she posted a picture of a pet, pet dog, right? No, we took it down. We said, dear girl, you know, this is not a place to post the pets. But uh, I, I think what is very important is really to set the tone of your platform right from day one. It's like Pinterest, right? You look at Pinterest, beautiful stuff. I, I don't think it started that way, right? So I think you have to set the tone of your, your, your platform, right? And my analogy, uh, when I was asked by the anchor, right? I say it's like uh, Disneyland, right? If you go to Disneyland, you know what Disneyland stands for. Right? You go there, you know, bring your kids, have fun. You're going to see Mickey Mouse. It's clean, right? You don't go to Disneyland having, you know, with beer and stuff like that. So I think that's the premise of what we started out to do in Closet. We make sure that the content, the initial content that we populate resonates with the, or is aligned with the position that we want to. Right? We encourage people. We reward people who, who share the similar type of uh, relevant content. So I think those are some of the things that we did to shape the crowd. Not to control, right? So I think you can shape it, but you can't control it. Um, crowdsourcing takes time. Right? It's not something that is going to go back, you know, sit down a week and it's going to happen. It takes time and it takes effort. So I think you have to make sure that you really, really plan and resource for it. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of this, right? So basically, I think uh, these are some of the things that we did at Closet is, is something that we do all the time, it's ongoing. Uh, listen to the crowd. We do a lot of survey, polls, uh, online intelligence, disclosure. You know, earlier you can see I, I invested in a company called Brandology. Uh, we listen, right? We listen, we analyze, we look at people's sentiments. Uh, those solutions are not expensive, right? I think before you start engaging the crowd, Really, I think you should understand what the crowd thinks about your brand, your services. Right? I mean, just don't just go back and jump onto the bandwagon. No, look at the crowd. What, what are they talking about you? What type of conversations are you having? Are you going to be successful at engaging them? Right? If they already have a positive uh, impression of a company, reinforce that. If they have negative sentiments about a company, how do you dispel those? So I think very important to really listen to the crowd before you start anything. Then assess that. What are, they, what are they talking about you? Your product, your brand, your services, shape your strategy, develop your content. What's the story? Why? You know? There's so many people out there. So why must I be part of your community? I think it's very key to have a good story to tell them. Interact with them. Now we did a lot of survey, right? Now of course user likes to be recognized, but they like to be rewarded as well. So some of the things that we are piloting uh, on Closet, um, we'll probably be rolling that up by end of the month. So we want to incentivize people. So our, our notion is really users come to Closet, 
they curate, right? This is crowd curation. They curate things that they like. They curate things according to a team, right? They curate things according to their style, right? Is it vintage? Is it a Japanese uh, kawaii style? Is it a K-pop style? And market that to the friends, to the network. And if the friends like the design, they're incentivized into buying. And we share the commission with them. So they are highly motivated right, to do that. So I'll share with you a little bit of some of the results uh, that we've gotten from some tests that we've done. Now, of course, finally, uh, influence them, right? Look at who are the key influencers. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. This is interesting. So, you know, typically in the social media world, these are some of the motivations. And you can see that right at the top, 40%, right? They like to receive discounts and promotions. <laughs> so this is something that uh, is good to bear in mind. People like incentives, right? So I think again, find ways to incentivize the crowd. Um, now, this is something that we... Uh, help brands with. This is what I call the social funnel. It's very similar to your uh, you know, purchase funnel. And this is currently how the crowd, right, how the users are seeking content. And at different stages, you'll find a fan. And along the way, as you engage with them, they become your follower. And finally, you know, these are really your advocate, your friend. Right? So this is some of the funnels and this is how users behave. Uh, if you look at number two, consideration. This is the part where, at least in, in the closet world, right? a lot of women look at what other users are buying. They look at, what, they look at recommendation. Now, is this good for me? You know, my skin is dry. You know, is this uh, so on and so forth. So I, I think that they are seeking the peer. Uh, recommendations. So this is how a lot of consumer are behaving. Now, Closet is working with some global e-commerce partners. Uh, increasingly, I think across all industry, e-commerce players today are trying to move beyond what they call click and buy. Right? Click and buy. I think that that is the old model. Comparison, shopping, click, buy, cheapest. But today, I think what is emerging, and this is where we are playing in, is what we call social commerce, discovery commerce. Right? User wants to discover. And through discovery, that's where they are engaging with the community, and that shapes their purchase decision. So increasingly, you see a lot of e-commerce companies getting into the social space. So this is where, at Closet, we see the convergence of content, community, and commerce. Right, it's coming next five years. I think you should watch this space. Um, this is my final slide. I'm a big believer in uh, integrated marketing. Right? I caution that you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bath water. I think crowdsourcing, social media, whatnot, should be a part of your 360 marketing engagement program. Right? Not every piece works for everyone, but you should examine how this fits into your overall strategy. Right? I don't think you should just look at crowdsourcing on a standalone. Look at how crossing can be weaved into the fabric of your organization, right? into the fabric of the way you reach out. I think uh, if you look at your consumers, right, uh, many of them would straddle a very different social status, uh, age group, so on and so forth. So I think this is where uh, it's very key that you find different ways to engage with these users. Okay. Last one. Okay. Now, this is a case study that I want to show you. We did a um, um, a campaign when we launched ASOS on Closet. Uh, our campaign was very simple. We say, go to ASOS and curate 
five of your favorite items under fifty dollars. Okay, we just say five. Now we're trying to get users to curate because ASOS have 30, 40,000 items, right? So we're asking the crowd to curate their favorite five items. Now these were the top curators. Can you look at the numbers? We say five, right? And they get a small price. I think it's only a $50 voucher. 56 items. 62 items. 62 items. 68 items. 121 items. I mean, we said five. So you can see if you have the right kind of content, it resonates. And, and it's amazing. Right? You can go to closet site and you click and see what they've curated. Uh, but if you look at the end result, we didn't ask them to buy. Right? We say just curate, share with your friends. Uh, but through the discovery process, we generated 121 transactions, you know, accounting for $4,700. I think that's quite interesting in the sense that this is where, you know, through the curation process, the, the, the users actually end up buying with us, us telling them to do so. So I hope that uh, uh, my experiences would uh, help you with shaping some of the ways that crowdsourcing might perhaps uh, help you with your businesses or any new ideas that you have. Thank you.